Good morning. This is M. Chizaji Axon. I'm the Director of Urban Ag and Gardening Education at the University of the District of Columbia. In this workshop, I'd like to talk about something that we probably don't really think a lot about. Uh, maybe some of you do, maybe some of you don't. And I began to think about these things quite a while ago because uh, as, a, as a farmer sometimes, I would always look for crops that had a, you know, I was looking for easier way to uh, deal with pests and things like that on the farm. So um, I ran across some information a while ago, but um, I just wanted to talk this morning about um, a very kind of interesting topic of how plants protect themselves, plants that protect themselves from pests. Um, and I'll show you some interesting ways how this is done, but it's, uh, it's very interesting in the plant kingdom how this really happens, but it does happen in, in quite a few ways. So a couple years ago, I bought a, uh, a bug vacuum. And this vacuum is just to vacuum bugs off of plants. Uh, it worked uh, well, and um, it was very good at you know dealing with the uh, some cucumber beetles and harlequin bugs. And also, it even took some of the worms off the bra uh, brassica and tomato plants. But it always seems that the pests don't bother certain crops. It just always seems that way. So uh, even though I had it not been you know, I had not planned, you know, pest resistant varieties. Uh, you're probably already growing some of these in your yard. Even if you not noticed it, uh, certain varieties in your garden sometimes seem to escape uh, attacks better than others. So uh, we're going to talk about how to select some varieties that you will love but your bugs will hate. We're going to start with tomatoes first. So uh, there are some tomato varieties that have some, um, you know, resistant to some pest resistance. So uh, tomatoes uh, may be the champs of natural insect insect resistance. They are a variety of means uh, that they do this, including hairy leaves, chemical compounds, and thick skins to protect themselves against pests. The greatest level of pest resistance occur and the wild relatives of your own familiar garden tomatoes. So some of the cherry tomatoes are very closely related to the very wild relatives of uh, the original tomato. So I've done a little research to find out which vegetables have some natural pest resistance. Uh, I'm not talking about disease resistance. That's a, another program, though. But uh, natural pest resistance, which is related to um, sometimes just to the, the, the architecture of the plant, how the plant is built, uh, this color scheme, or some other things. So uh, you might be growing a variety of crops, and uh, some of these crops may have some common resistance to pests. And one uh, crop that the pest might be, uh, one resistance that the pest might have might be to tomato, fruit worm, leaf miners, spider mites, and white flies, or some of these um, wilder relatives of tomatoes. So if your fruit worms are a problem in your, in your garden or farm, uh, the research is, indicates that you should try to grow uh, certain types of tomatoes. Roma, Tiny Tim, Yellow Pear, there's Ace, there's Ace 55, and there's Chico, and there's a virus resistant uh, variety of bush variety of tomato. Some varieties resist pests thanks to chemical compounds in their leaves. Others have especially thick skin fruits. And the thick skin helps the tomato resist attacks uh, from the Lidoptera pest, uh, the uh, tomato hornworms, including the tomato fruit worm, and also the army worm. And also another crop uh, plant uh, pest that attacks tomatoes is the, uh, sometimes the beet worm and army worms are attacking uh, your tomatoes. But the, Chinese, the cherry type of tomatoes have the best and most pest resistance. Other pest resistant tomato varieties are Brimmer, Pearson, Pritchard, Early Girl, Early Anna, Patio, and Superstate. Some of these pest uh, uh, crops are pest resistant to leaf miner, tomato pinworm, and the southern armyworm. So, Another crop that really has some, uh, some, some of them have some pest resistance are beans. Uh, if you've ever grown soybeans and things like that, you kind of felt the velvety feel of the hair on the beans. So 
Um, if tiny hairs on the leaves of pods or the beans offer defense against aphids, leaf hoppers, Mexican bean beetle larvae. So sometimes if you can find some varieties of these beans, like the velvet bean, has a very hairy coat, and some other beans have that too, so it makes them, uh, gives them a special type of pest resistance. So if aphids or leaf hoppers are some of your problem pests, uh, some beans and pods, like I said, on them have tiny hairs that prevent these small insects from getting a foothold. There are even uh, hairs sometimes even impale some of these insects. There's even some evidence that these hairs may even slow the growth of pests like Mexican bean beetles because the beetles have to eat through the hairs before they can get to the leaves. Uh, some varieties of uh, these would be bountiful stringless, gold crop wax beans, lima beans, and uh, another type of Italian uh, bean might have some resistance in that, in that case. So, moving on to uh, one of the favorite crops of many people, uh, especially down south and, and in this area alone, people love to grow collard greens. And I really had to find out really how to protect collards when I was farming because um, I often sold to restaurants. And that was one of the last things that you wanted to do was take a crop in and try to sell it to a chef with a lot of holes in the leaves. It was just, um, you know, something that you didn't want to do and they didn't want to accept it for their presentation. So you had to really kind of find out very, uh, you know, important ways to take care of some of these, these pests. So um, one crop of uh, collard greens that I'm going to talk about, and some of the Nebraska, uh, in the Nebraska plant family, are the um, green glaze. It's a uh, collard green, but it has a very glossy leaves. And the glossy leaves on the brassica, brassica such as the green glades collard, plant inhibit the fitting, feeding of cabbage loopers, imported cabbage worm, diamondback moth, larvae, and cabbage aphids. So this is a, I guess, a typical non-green glaze collard plant, but you can see just the pest infestation there of the uh, cabbage loop are just having a field day and, uh, and uh, kind of having at it. So um, that's what you don't want. So there's some ways to do it, but one of the ways is picking a variety of crop like the green glaze, uh, which has a little bit of resistance and uh, it won't allow the loopers to do this type of damage to your, to your uh, crop. So uh, most brassica plants have a dull waxy leaf surface. The green glazed collars that I talked about have a high gloss, have high glossy leaves, and this gloss works to the plant's advantage. The glossy leaves inhibit the feeding of cabbage family pests, including the diamondback moth, like I said earlier, cabbage loopers, imported cabbage worm, cabbage aphids. And the experiments that they had done uh, concluded that the glossy leaf cauliflower, kale, uh, and, and collars had. 80 to 95 percent fewer pests than the standard varieties. Purple Vienna kohlrabi have fewer loopers and worm attacks than the traditional green varieties of kohlrabi. So, uh, speaking of growing these kind of crops like the Nebraska plant family, one of the key factors is, is just earliness, getting your crop out early before the insects kind of get out active and increasing their uh, populations and things like that. So that's a key factor, just getting early, getting your crop out early and finding crops that mature early, finding early varieties that mature earlier rather than later in the season. Um, this beats the uh, pest to the punch. So if cabbage, if cabbage aphids are a problem, uh, look for smooth leaf crop varieties as opposed to the curly leaf uh, crop varieties. Um, some smooth leaf varieties are bok choy and red Russian kale. Uh, one of the uh, insects I wanted to talk about before we even uh, talk about is, is the corn earworm. So uh, a lot of people don't grow corn. And corn is a you know crop that some people grow in their gardens and some people don't. They think they need a lot of space to grow corn. 
you really don't need a lot of space. You just have to grow the corn in blocks of six deep, six wide, and deep, things like that. But it has to be grown in the blocks so pollination occurs. But uh, the, the uh, life cycle is pretty interesting that the uh, corn earworm, it, it starts off as a, a, a moth or butterfly, and it, then it lays an egg, and that egg turns into a larvae, and then that larvae just starts to feed upon the uh, plant. So most of the time what the corn earworm does, it lays eggs on the silk of the corn silk of the plant. And so when that larvae, when that egg develops into a larvae, it then starts crawling around looking for food. And so there's only two ways that the larvae wants to go. It can't go the opposite direction because it will fall off the plant, but it goes toward the ear of corn. And this, and this goal is to get inside that ear of corn to cause uh, damage. So uh, what they really realize is that um, the, the tightness of the husk. There are some varieties of corn that have a tight husk, and there are some varieties of corn that have a non-tight husk. So uh, there, these are two major factors that help, factors that help against corn-resistant earworm invasions, uh, the tightness of the husk and the crown. And also, sometimes there's a naturally occurring chemical found in the silk of the corn. The chemical is called mycin. This chemical slows the growth of earworms who eat it, eat the silk, and it may lower their egg production by as much as 50%. Right, uh, the right breeding work is done mostly on field corn. Though. So there's field corn and there's the kind of sweet corns that you use at, at the barbecue in the summertime, but the sweet corns and field corn is more corns that are fed to the animals. Or sometimes maybe for popcorn or flour, making flour and things like that. Uh, there are many, there are a lot of uh, really nice uh, varieties of corn that have some good uh, taste and also have a small amount of uh, pest resistance. Uh, the number one corn in this area that you will find, as most people grow and most of the growers grow down in southern Maryland and Virginia, is sweet corn. Um, there's another older variety, it's called Black, Black Mexican. This one is surprisingly, it's called Black Mexican, but uh, it is a sweet corn variety that is uh, kind of started up in New England, whose kernels turn a bluish black when dry. And uh, there's another one called Hickory King, which is a dent corn, but it can be also eaten sweet. So when I say dent corn, I'm usually referring to corn that is fed to animals, but sometime at the earliest stages, you can eat it. Uh, there are a lot of other varieties of corn. Uh, we'll, I'll show you some pictures of those later, but there's a uh, rainbow Inca has a uh, tight husk, and sometimes the leaves cover the tips. Uh, one interesting variety of sweet corn called Florida State Sweet tended to be less vulnerable due to the fact that the earworm lays their eggs on the tassels of the corn rather than the silk. So the tassels are the pollen producing part of the plant, so some, uh, some resistance is there. Uh, we talked about beans earlier, but peas um, are another crop that we could uh, talk about. Um, everybody likes uh, snap peas and things like that. But there's a pea called green arrow pea, which uh, repels aphids. Um, there are some other peas, and if you just look for aphid-resistant peas and things like that, it'll probably give you a list of a few more, which are really, um, really, really great. So moving on to uh, moving on to squash. Uh, squash plants are, you know, summer squash, winter squash, and all these types of plants are important for the diet. But they're very good crops to grow. And um, one of the crops, one of the plants, uh, pests that you have to worry about for uh, squash is the um, squash vine borer. Now, the very interesting characteristic to protect themselves against the destructive squash wine borer are some squash varieties that develop additional roots at the leaf nodes along the gram. So you know uh, you're growing squash and it spreads on the ground and it's some squashes on those nodes of those tendrils that are running out they put down other roots because when they don't you only have one main structure of a root system or stalk and that is usually the place where the squash 
buying board goes to bore a hole into that part when you have one. But so some of the other plants, they, they put out these other uh, called advantageous rootings, and that allows the plant to uh, still produce uh, without it getting that central stalk uh, uh, invaded by the squash vine borer. So here's a picture of the squash vine borer, uh, the adult moth, again a moth. Uh, it lays eggs and those eggs turn into a larvae. And then they start searching for that stem, that, that one stem that comes up from the uh, seed that you planted, and that is the stem they attack. And um, stops production of your, your, your crop. So some, riot, some varieties uh, that put out those uh, advantageous roots are the, uh, uh, the squash called a Tahitan winter squash. Uh, another, another crop uh, that we're going to talk about probably is also um, cucumber. And um, the cucumber, if you've ever grown cucumbers, some cucumbers are very, kind of have a hard outside skin and they're kind of spiny. Well, that protects the cucumbers. Uh, and also the uh, skin, the bitterness of the skin of the cucumber really protects it. So that is the major deterrent uh, for uh, uh, pest uh, resistance for it, a lot of uh, plants of that nature. So uh, insects uh, feeding on uh, cucumbers, uh, the, 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 uh, there is a chemical that the cucumber plant produces. Uh, and that chemical is very, uh, it gives some of the in insects indigestion. So it get, might give the uh, spider mice indigestion, or sometimes it even gives the uh, uh, striped or six spotted cucumber beetles some, some indigestion. So there are some varieties that uh, you, that have that uh, that uh, characteristic. So another thing you want to do about, especially when growing cucumbers, is that uh, the the six-spotted uh, cucumber beetle and the striped cucumber beetle. These these uh, beetles that feed on squash and love these uh, cucumbers and things like that. They transmit um, a bacterial wilt disease. So um, it's better sometimes to choose some varieties which they don't like that much and they'll be less likely to stay around in your garden and, and then eat your plant and also transfer that type of uh, diseases. Um, salad bush cucumber is uh, one that has that characteristic. So. Uh, I just want to talk a little bit briefly about, about seeds. Um, you know, everybody's going to be probably going out buying seeds this year. Seeds are really big this year. Everybody's buying seeds. And um, I would impress upon you to grow a garden. Because I said, heard on the radio the other day, they said that one seed, one seed can produce as much as $25 worth of produce for you. Let's figure that out. One seed in your garden. If you can grow it up, you can get at least almost $25 worth of produce from that. So selecting seeds is one of the things you really want to look at. So uh, seeds kind of come in, uh, we're not talking about genetically modified seed, that's a whole different other thing which we don't, you know, we don't really use here, and I don't use personally. Uh, but um, they're open pollinate varieties and then hybrid seeds. So um, open pollinate produce uh, seed true to type, and then they're allowed to cross pollinate with the other plants the same variety, so sometimes they can cross-pollinate. Uh, hybrid seeds are another thing. So hybrid seeds are varieties that are produced from crossing of two different inbred lines. So one of the things about saving seeds from these two type of uh, seed types, so the open-pollinated variety, you can save those seeds from year to year to year to year. Sometimes people have saved open-pollinated seeds for hundreds of years and get the same kind of crop that they did from the original seed. Hybrid varieties of seeds sometimes don't allow you to do that. Sometimes what you probably will get if you save the seed and try to plant it out again, it will revert back to one of the parentage in the genetic line. So it will give you a uh, something that you're probably not familiar with, that you might not like the taste, but it will give you something not uh, it will quite different from the crop that you uh, originally got it from.
Uh, another crop, which is um, one of my favorite crops, is um, cow peas or black eyed peas. So um, uh, there are a lot of different varieties of these which you can grow. And so uh, black eyed peas can be eaten green. So this is the, the, the right hand side of the picture is a, a vegetative kind of green, uh, undried uh, black eyed pea pod. At the bottom of that is the traditional kind of uh, black eyed peas that you get and people eat for you know certain ceremonies in Africa and certain times of the year here. But uh, you can eat uh, black eyed peas uh, in the green stage. So there's a few different uh, varieties of these that that are, that are are available. One is called Better Green, Santai, Pink Eye, and uh, sometimes what happens these thick pods. Uh, our chemical deterrents. Okay, moving on to um, one of my favorite crops and a very nutritious one is sweet potatoes. So, um, uh, sweet potatoes, uh, they have a deterrent in their skin sometimes, which uh, deter uh, flea beetles, sometimes it deters wire worm, also determines cucumber beetles if they can get to it, and also root grubs. So, there's a uh, a variety of uh, white flesh uh, sumer, S-U-M-O-R, sweet potato, which is, um, has some pest resistance. There's the red skinned uh, Southern Delight on the left hand side of the picture on the screen. Uh, there's the all favorite standard XL. And there's another uh, sweet potato called Carolina Bunch, which is available. So I'm going to just kind of go over some of these, uh, give you a chance to look at some of these varieties. If you're looking for some pest resistance in the variety of uh, tomatoes, um, there they are, Brimmer, Red Cherry, Pritchard, Tiny Tim Tomato. Uh, beans would be uh, Gold Crop Wax Bean, Henderson Bush Lima Bean, Bountiful Stringless Bush Snap Bean, sorry, bean, I got bean, it should be B-E-A-N at the bottom. Uh, brassicas. This is one that I'm looking to try. There is, um, if you like Brussels sprouts, have you ever grown Brussels sprouts? Though? So there is a Brussels, you, we always see the traditional green variety of Brussels sprouts. So you've probably never even seen Brussels sprouts this color, what we call red rubine. And there's kohlrabi, the uh, purple kohlrabi. Pac-Man broccoli, green glazed collars, we talked about that earlier. There's a cabbage called Danish ball head cabbage. And then there's red Russian kale, which have some uh, pest resistance. And corn, we talked about um, corn earlier. We talked about uh, silver queen, but see, there's some other varieties um, that I would, it, you know, uh, advise you try out just the taste and other ways. I'm sorry. So, um, black Aztec sweet, queen, uh, sweet, silver queen, black Mexican sweet. Hickory King Dent, Rainbow Inca Sweet, Florida Stay Sweet, and another variety called Miracle. All have a, a bit of pest resistance. Squash, uh, Butternut, Sun Drop Summer Squash, and the, uh, we saw earlier the uh, Tahitian Winter Squash is the one you should look for for some pest resistance. Cucumbers, uh, salad bush, market more 80 and 86. Uh, the picture in the left is the Soyo long cucumber, an Asian cucumber, and there's a cucumber called Jazzer cucumber, which have some pest resistance. Peas would be the green arrow shell pea, sugar snap, pod pea, better grow, better green, and Santee Early Pink Eye. Some nice tasting and peas there. Sweet potatoes, uh, we just talked about that uh, a few minutes ago, but the uh, Carolina Bunch, Sumor, Southern Delight, Delight, and XL all have a bit of pest resistance. So um, this might make your gardening a little easier. Um, it's always easy when you don't have to deal with the pest, but I can tell you this, if you learn how to deal with the pest and you can deal with the pest, it makes you a better grower. It makes you a more intelligent grower.
So until next time, this is M.J. Zadi Axon, Director of Urban Ag and Guardian Education for Causes, and I've just uh, spoke to you guys about plants that protect themselves from pests. All right. Thank you.